All right, let's get her going. It's the Real Kipper and Bourne Show. We're live on Sportsnet 590, Sportsnet 360, and Sportsnet Plus. Can't catch us live. Get us on a podcast. In Texas at 590-590. Sammy is all raring to go as we close out this week. Why are you all, you know what, in giggles right now? I'm just, so, uh, full disclosure, I saw a really funny Shohei Otani-related meme. And I, it, it hit me and it made me laugh. And I didn't think you saw me laugh. So, okay, um, get me up to speed on this. His interpreter's in trouble. So, His, I don't really know. He's all the, in trouble. I don't know a lot of the alleged details. There's a lot of details, and a lot of them are alleged, boys. But it's not pretty. There was a four and a half million dollar wire transfer from his bank account to a supposed illegal uh, bookie because gambling's illegal in in uh, California. California. There's no betting. They have no commercials. No, no, they have no nothing. nothing. It's illegal there. So really. I, Listen, it's like I everybody said, was cleared by now. Not accusing anyone of anything, but this ain't pretty. And this is not the way Rob Manford probably wanted to start his MLB season with his biggest superstar who just sent a seven hundred million dollar have it as an interpreter be betting same game parlays. They, probably not what they, they wanted. They initially said that it was the interpreter who had been gambling and that Shohei covered the debt for him. And then it turns out you can't wire money to a bookie, so Shohei was gonna be in trouble. So they said the interpreter stole the money. Stole the money. So they've changed their story. So now the interpreter's on the hook for... Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's quite a story. Great drama. It a- is. As the world turns on this one. Buddy, if he had to come to Toronto, he'd be fine. There you go. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's not inconceivable <laughs> that he could end up with a voided contract. And, you know, maybe Toronto's here with the next one. Let's go. We'll take it for 600. I'll take back everything I said. <laughs> All right, you can bet on that one. <laughs> Let's get her going on our Leaf edition of the Real Kipper and Born Show. The Leafs beat up on the Washington Capitals, led by Austin Matthews with his 56th, 57th, and what we thought was his 58th, only to come back on a Todd Bertuzzi hangnail. Who? Tyler. Tyler. Tyler Bertuzzi. <laughs> I mean, that's the worst oldies. leg drag I've ever seen. <laughs> Just stop at the blue line, man. Just cut laterally. Do something. Oh, man. But outside of that, uh, listen, we, we spent a good portion of yesterday's show talking about mm-hmm. having a good start. And lo and behold, 16 seconds in, one nothing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. You see how that works? Yeah. That was nice. Nice, nice change of pace there. I don't know if they looked that different. They just... They didn't hit the post this time. They went into the net this time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was good, though. Good to see, you know, the uh, to break some of the narratives that they had going after a tough night in Philadelphia. Um, you know, back-to-back in Washington to come out hot like that was great. And it was the start of a great night for Max Domi, four assists. Him and Matthews have a little something going, a little two-man game going there. And uh, I think that's a, a main point of intrigue for me is, is that real or is that just a blip? In about... 30 minutes, we're going to welcome in Craig Simpson, former NHLer, Stanley Cup champion twice, and of course, Hockey Night in Canada. And we've had Craig on many times. Probably been a little bit more difficult for him uh, because we got pushed later on in the day, but we're thrilled to have him on today. Uh, Dan Murphy at the top of the hour as well to get into some Canucks, another big, famous name from Hockey Night in Canada. Mm. couple of couple of big famous legends names tonight. Oh, yeah. Absolute Sportsnet, <laughs> Hockey Night Canada legends, only on the real Kipper and Board Show. Okay, so Borny, we're going to start off uh, our Kipper's Clipper with Sheldon Keefe on his overview of the game, and we'll get into the look that you were speaking of, of Domi and Matthews. Yes, sir. I really liked it. Obviously, a little bit of a flip of the script in terms of our starts in the first and second period, but uh, it was good to see, and, and then probably even better than that was that each time Washington got one and looked like they were getting life, uh, we stayed on the attack and, and uh, built our lead from there. So uh, I liked the response in, overall in the game, but also liked the response within the game as it was going on. All right, so the Leafs handled their business. Right? They took care of the, the Capitals. Should I be the first one to say it? Cap stink, man. Okay. <laughs> See, the, the Leafs handle their business. They don't were great. go there Good because game. everybody's going to go. 
like, it's not two you're things not to be giving true. the Leafs enough credit. You can That's only, the danger that we fall into on this show. You can only beat who you play. <laughs> not everyone is good. They handled their business. Good job, Leafs. The Leafs went in and handled a team that had been rested who is scrapping for their playoff lives. Yes. And they yes. went in there in the second half of back-to-back, and they beat them. They came they off the one of the best goalie in the month of March. They came off which, uh, how did that a 10-day Western trip, too, which yeah. is not helping Didn't them. play in the Caps' favor, for sure. Did not play in the Caps' favor, and Lingren probably had one of his worst games this season. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the Caps were in a tough spot, too. And whatever, but I'm just saying, can I not say the Capitals don't look very good? Okay, can I go one step further? Sure. Please. Rasmus Sandin, they signed him to what again? <laughs> Was it four and a half million per season? I think he got like 25 million bucks for six years. Boy, oh boy. Did you watch him try to get over the blue line? And toe drag <laughs> like Lilligren? three times. Yeah. He was he was trying to trying. He was trying to make a point. I really hope at some point someone on the Washington Capitol bench said, "Okay, you don't play there that's, anymore." That's the reason why they got rid of you. Yeah, four point six until twenty twenty nine. He had an assist. He was plus one last night, boys. What was wrong? Is he is he the best they have on that blue line? Uh, I don't know. No, Anyways. I mean it's, he's not. But anyway, so not, not the best night from Washington. Um, Leafs look real good. In terms of that top line, Bertuzzi, kind of a strange start to the game. He didn't play. It had everybody out there on uh, what's wrong with Tyler Bertuzzi. Sammy had the best tweet about it. What did you tweet? Oh, I, I forget what Something like he was late for the game. Oh, yeah, he's having a dart and a monster. He's having a dart and a monster <laughs> energy. I tried to say, like, I couldn't find his warm-up jorts. <laughs> you know, but he was late for a meeting. Listen, it's uh, it 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 does speak volumes to the league in general on just lack of depth. Like the Leafs don't have anybody else. Like they actually, if 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 you didn't start off feeling well, it's not like you're 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 saying okay, go back to the room, you're done. They they there's just a lack of depth right now in lineups. To, to they, they'd rather have him on the bench, and I, like Washington Capitals. Okay, and we'll, not to get into Wilson having a in person hearing on his slash on on Gregor, but they're going to lose him for five or six games. They're screwed too. They don't have anybody else mm-hmm. to come in and and fill a void, or not that you can fill a void on on Wilson, but like there there is nobody. There is not even a close NHL quality body that you can bring in for the next five games for the Washington Capitals. So it's just weird to me that Bertuzzi, if he's not feeling great, you just, you left him on the bench to weather it through. Well, to me, you're on the road trips. You probably only brought X amount of bodies. Ryan Reeves took a thumb to the retina or whatever yeah. happened in his fight last night. So you can't put him in after warm up. So it's like, you know, we don't know how he was feeling necessarily, but not great, it sounds like. But what did he end up with last night? You know, he was obviously well enough. We just had the one goal, hey? Yeah, I one thought, point. I, yeah. thought, I thought he was a lot more involved in that. I guess he had the screen Couple on the screens. Matthews goal that, yeah. that was helpful. But he did his part, you know, got in there for all of 14 minutes or something. So, but that was weird. I was trying to figure what was going on. But I guess the, it was illness. So he did get in for 14? Yeah. And he missed the first 10 minutes of the first. So he played a normal shift, basically, right after, after that. That, that is strange. That if you're so, going to... Very weird. Might as well just start him if you're going to use him. And I saw Bruder filmed it. I went back because I saw something at the start of the game. Yeah. And Sheldon Keith and the trainer were having, before they did the Chris Simon uh, moment of silence, him and they were having a spirited conversation. Like he was like pointing at the trainer and saying something to him. And it's like, I don't know, do you have the trots? What, like what, yeah. what was wrong with him? I, he obviously, I mean, you have the flu, like something weird. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't compl- want to hear the clip. Yeah, we got a clip. Yeah. Okay. On Bertuzzi. He was, uh, it was questionable whether he was even going to play tonight. And uh, so, you know, he was, he just before warm up was saying he just wasn't feeling right. And, and uh, went through warm up, still wasn't quite feeling it. Um, 
but uh, felt good enough to the point that he was going to stay in uniform. He didn't have any others in uniform here tonight. Our only other eligible player was was Brody, who we were sort of given a, a mental day uh, to, away today anyhow, so decided to stick with Burton, but he just he wanted some time before the game was going, just getting out there with the, the noise and all the things that go on uh, in the chaos of the game just to make sure he was good. Uh, once we got through the first TV timeout, he got went out for a little skate and thought he was he was good to go so we put him put him in the mix i kind of don't believe him agree <laughs> i i kind of feel like maybe bert missed a meeting or whatever and they're like you're gonna miss the first 10 minutes of the game we don't want to make yeah, a story out of it so i, I don't believe you <laughs> i would um in today's world like maybe you could bluff your way a few years ago but in today's world we know too much yeah that stuff you can't keep internal, and if there is something, then Sheldon's caught in a flat-out lie. Yeah, it's way I'll worse today okay. than it would be yeah. years ago. It's like pulling an Otani. You can't yes. lie like that. Yeah. No, you and, can't. And he really went in on it, it by saying he went out at the timeout. Like he did go all the way in on it, so it's probably and not it's, a lie. It, it's all just right. it's, it's not convinced. worth it. It's just not worth him no, to get to, for him to get caught in in a, in a lie. Yeah. Nope. So. Classic Toronto media, buddy, uh, trying oh. to start it off. <laughs> <laughs> Holy. All right, I'm convinced. I'm convinced. Uh, Good okay. game by him. Yeah. Top line. Mm -hmm. Before uh, we dive into this uh, deeper, let's go to Sheldon Keefe talking about uh, Matthews, Domi, and Bertuzzi. Well, yesterday, I liked him, which is why we wanted to stay with it today, but obviously today was... Today was even better. I mean, those guys uh, had a little more time uh, uh, with the puck today, and they just uh, just made plays. So yeah, it was uh, like I said, Max was outstanding. I uh, thought Austin put on the clinic uh, through most of the game here tonight, and uh, you know Bert was battling some, through something here today with the illness, and and uh, even, even he once he got going into the game, he was good. So what All do right. you think, Kip? You buy? Are you game. buying or selling this as a real line? Uh, game 67, first of all, yeah. that they push Domi up with Matthews. <laughs> we, we only talked about it since game two. Know. Insanity. Yeah. yeah. Like, what What took you so long? Give it a look. You know, he's an elite offensive mind and with some skills. Like, let's just check it out. Like, we don't have to love it, but let's find out. Yeah. And they seem to really like playing with one another. Well, first of all, that's how I envisioned uh, Max Domi, uh, not to be a number one left winger on the line, but yeah. a guy that can just move up and down your lineup mm -hmm. accordingly. And right now, it's it's a good thing. Yeah. Now, is Max going to hold this spot? I would hope come Saturday against the Edmonton Oilers, which is a big game. Massive. Anyway, anyway, you slice it. I don't care standings, no standings. Move up, move down. Sexy matchup regardless. It doesn't matter. It's a measuring stick kind of game for the way you're going to feel moving forward. Yeah. I expect Max to be on the left side. I expect Austin Matthews, and I expect Mitch Marner. You do? Yes. Ooh, buddy, yeah. that would be wonderful. I'd love yeah, to see how that looks. That's the line I expect. Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, go ahead. No. Well, you know, you're going up against the Edmonton Oilers measuring stick game with, you know, their elite talent, and, you know, you want to have a sense for – can Domi play in that spot? You haven't given it a look, and you've got Matthew Nyes there, who doesn't necessarily work, but he's not terrible. Bertuzzi doesn't necessarily work, but he's not terrible. He's Max makes plays. Max has vision yeah. that Bertuzzi doesn't, or or Nyes. Nyes played half the season on that line with his head down. I'm yeah. sorry, but mm -hmm. and, and his point production has shown that. And, and even the last couple games, I've seen him and Matthews try to make a couple of plays. They're just not in no, sync. No, Max makes plays. I just think they're so obsessed with having someone on the forecheck who wins back pucks for, for Mitch and Austin. Eventually, if you're up against Florida in the first round, that might be an issue. Yeah, but give it a look But again. give it a look. So You just hope that between now and the end of the year that there's there's ample proof why you want to give it some some time game one and game two of the Stanley Cup playoffs if, if you're leaning towards it. So I want to ask you a question. In the absence of Mitch Marner with Austin Matthews, yeah. his three assists aside last night, do you feel like he's passing the puck more? Does it look like he's trying to do something different? or? Buddy, I've been calling for this forever. Yeah. Okay? 
last night, Austin Matthews was a centerman. Mm -hmm. And and there's no question that I, I'm sure Sheldon or somebody went up to him. And the moment I heard, what, a few days ago, facilitator, mm -hmm. that's another way to say to Austin Matthews, buddy, start passing the puck. Mm -hmm. Start moving the puck and give yourself a different look. So you, do you think at all it's like Mitch isn't here so someone has to, or do you think it's that someone talked no, to him and said? someone yeah. talked to him. Yeah. And I can appreciate on some nights our, our boy Sammy calling Austin the second best player in the world. But a week ago, the I would never second best player in the world was tied for 114th in the league in assists. Mm -hmm. There's there's not a world that exists that Austin Matthews last week should have been 114th in the league in assists. Mm -hmm. Last night, to me, was the, one of the few times that Austin looked like Connor and Nathan mm -hmm. McKinnon, and he looked less like Ovi, who just wants to get open in the offensive zone, wave the stick up in the air, mm -hmm. and say, feed me. Well, so what I'm curious about then is, like, when Mitch comes back, does this free you up a little bit to not have to have the two of them together and let Mitch drive yeah. another line? Because Mitch can. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, yes, I yeah. think there's a possibility that maybe you could – part them yeah. if 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 Austin continues to have a, a different kind of look mm -hmm. because I think over the the last few years there's been a tremendous amount of pressure on Mitch Marner to get Austin the puck mm -hmm. and it's like I told you then it becomes a little repetitive uh predictable and I just I loved Austin last night looking like a a true centerman yeah so I asked um Thanks to Megan Shake at Stathletes. I asked Stathletes for this, uh, for a stat on his passing before the last six er, games with Marner out and with, with, with and without Marner. Yeah. And so he's uh, averaging six more passes per game since Mitch has been out, so over these most recent yeah. games. And his passes to the slot have gone from 1.9 per game to 4.1 wow. per game. 4.2 leads yeah. the NHL. That's it's, Kucherov. It's just... And he's 4.1 since Mitch has been out. He's, he's he's just conscious of it. Yeah. And I don't think he's happy to look at his assist total and go, I'm not up there with the elite right. in the game. And I, I think he's made a conscious effort to go out there and say, yeah, I'm going to start There's trying no to make more plays. no doubt it looks way better. It looks way better. It looks way better. So, and also the puck comes back to him, right? It, like, pushes people away and he can get open again. It's So let me throw this one at you because I was talking about this a little bit last night and I want to ask your opinion on it. Maybe you'll shoot me down crazy here. But if you want to keep Tavares as sort of your pseudo third line guy who has, you know, a chance against better matchups and he's looked good in that sort of role. Yep. And you want to keep Marner and Matthews on separate lines, but you're looking for a center, right? Because you have Domi on the top line. Would you ever consider in these last few games where you're trying everything anyway to try the Willie at center thing and put Marner on the wing with him? Before the end of the season, we we or Mitch at center. We have had these conversations. I know we before. have. Listen, because they told us to. Yes. In preseason, they said that yeah. they were going to do. We're going to give it some run. We're I believe. Give it some yeah. run, and, and they're like, I, I they wish, saw Fraser Minton squirrel. I, I wish they would have. Same. But you, right? but you think you can't try it now in these games that don't mean anything? He puts twenty-five different lines on the ice every game anyway. Why not try it? <laughs> okay, you got me. You're yeah. into I'm it? good with it. Okay. Yes, I am. And I don't think for one second that they're locked in. They're not Paul Maurice and the Florida Panthers that have played with six lines in the last year and a half. Right. <laughs> They've experimented yeah. like 30 or 40 probably yeah. in the same amount of time. But I don't think anything's fixed right now when it comes to this, uh, this, this lineup and who ultimately will be with who in game one. So if you did Domi, Bertuzzi, Matthews, and then you had Mitch and Willie on a line together with yeah. Yarn Croc, maybe. I, yeah. I, I, I go Marner in the middle. Marner in the middle with, with Willie and... I wish he had a little bit more uh, experience in the last yeah. few years. I but just, he's a, he was always a natural centerman, Mitch Marner. I don't think you can just try... Like, to me, I think he'd probably be better at it, but it's an easier sell to be like the guy that we've talked about it in the past and has done it in the past as opposed to Mitch. Has he ever done it? At the NHL level, I don't think they ever have put him there. So, I don't think so. if it has, it's been, been so rare. minimal. Yeah, but but 
that's uh, that's a dozen, what, 14 games to go mm-hmm. to, to maybe just have a, a few different looks. But there's undeniable chemistry between Domi and Matthews. Like, they really yeah. do seem to play well together. They, they, Matthews likes playing with yeah. them because he gets him the puck I, in the right I spots am, and he I likes passing I am passing concerned to, to see how, you know, they have played two fringy playoff teams. I am curious to know if they could find space against Boston, Florida, those sort of teams, which is what we're trying to figure out. More than Big, anything. heavier yeah. teams. Does, can they yeah. find that space? Don't mean particular, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, OV, two goals. Kind of gives you the, he's what, 50 behind Gretzky? 49. So, so no, now, and it's 49? It's, no, it's 50, isn't it? Oh, I, it's 50. Okay. I might have said 49 on Leafs talk, but I think I was wrong. But I think it's 50. I'm just looking now. Whatever. I mean, it's it's that amount. But it's clear that he's getting there. this year and next year, it's feed me the puck. Feed me the puck. You, 49 have, from tying, 50 from the record. Have you ever seen anything more absurd than Dylan Strom passing out of the top of the crease to Ovi on that one play for Ovi to score? Ovi's second goal. I'm shocked it went in. It, I mean, it shouldn't have. Is there a pay, like some sort of, for like assist to Ovi? What was Strom doing? No, I'm telling you, the pressure on these kids yep. to get them the puck should not be underestimated. Think about it. Like, that's not Backstrom anymore, and it's not even Kuznetsov. You got McMichael. This guy's just learning Skilled. how to be an NHL player, and he's on the number one line with a guy going to break Wayne Gretzky's record. Can you just comprehend what kind of feeling that would be every game to get Ovi the puck yeah. for one second. Yeah. Think about it. I know. After Ovi leaves, they're all they're, none of them are going to know how to shoot. Yeah. They're all going to be oh, passing so it to right. each other. How many shot attempts would he have had last night? It felt like a thousand. Oh, he's taking fall away jumpers from the, the blue line. So yeah. I, I kind of you, you wonder what it's going to look like for the for the remainder of the season and all of next year for some of these kids to like the number one priority is Ovi getting this record. Yep, that's awful. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Like, what are we doing yeah, here? They ain't getting any better. Listen, they stay. It's it doesn't have. Ovi had eleven attempts. I, I last get night. what you're saying, but. No, no, no. I'm they, they right. Ju- they signed him to a, right. a five-year contract last year, and this is... Just a team orbiting around the sun that is Ovi, waiting for him yeah. to do his thing and turn into a black hole yeah, and go well, away before they all get to play hockey again? Barry Bonds, it's... You're chasing Hank. No, it's all about... The Bonds one's interesting. It's all about the moment mm-hmm. now. It's not about the team. It's yeah. about Ovi's moment. Right. And about the chase. It's about the chase. I mean, not, ugh, I hate to be on the side of Ovi, but it's not a minimal record he is chasing. He is chasing the all-time record for goals, which is the most important thing. Like it's, And it's not going to look pretty here. But He's when, the greatest goal scorer of all time. Disagree. He doesn't have the most goals of all time, so therefore not the greatest goal scorer of all time. <laughs> era adjusted, no, yes. No, yeah, era adjusted. Oh, all era right, adjusted. let's get... Uh, <laughs> yeah. let's get How would Ovi do in Gretzky's era? Uh, he would put he, it through Tom Barrasso's neck. He wouldn't have played... He wouldn't even been allowed in Canada. <laughs> right. He would have been in Russia, buddy. <laughs> do, do, we, uh, do we care about uh, Sheldon's thoughts on Ovi? Or not really? Yeah, we should play it, but it's fine. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I guess we're going to have to cover those one-timers in the pre-scout, maybe, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, you know, obviously he found that for two for in, in the net, but he found some others here tonight. Obviously guys look for him. And I don't love how we handled some of those situations, but yeah, world-class player. And, um, if we can get the two points and still allow him to add to his total, I guess we'll take that and everybody leaves, you know, somewhat happy. Ugh. Whatever. It's the right thing to say. No, it's not. What do you want him to say? We're trying to stop him from scoring goals. We don't want him to get the record. We want Austin Matthews to have the record. <laughs> Okay. That's what you should say. Right. Okay. Matthews, by the way, through 548 career NHL games, is about 20 goals ahead of Ovechkin's pace. 19 goals ahead of where Ovi was after 548. So. Okay. All right. He is. Okay. We got, we got to make up our minds here. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> I think I think there's a, an obsession over Matthews and 70 goals or chasing now Ovi. Okay. <laughs> The obsession, Sammy, should be winning a Stanley Cup. Agreed. All right? 
And no, no argument for me. And just to go to our, our, our conversation mm-hmm. a few minutes ago mm-hmm. where Austin's looking like a centerman and he's not shooting everything inside. I was one time a, a goal scorer mm-hmm. in junior <laughs> hockey. Okay, I've played with some of the best goal scorers. Yeah, Dangle and Paul Maurice. Your, uh, I okay. have the last two things you said on my resume. Goal scorers are cookie monsters, and they tend to be a little greedy. Yeah. We know that. You know that. Yeah. Okay, they like to score. They want their goals. Okay, they can't, they can't it's like oxygen. They can't breathe without it. And it's great that Ovi's been in the league and he's mustered 60, 70 goals and he's won one cup. No, 70. 65. Okay, whatever. It's a big difference. Okay. Yes. All right. He hasn't got 70. Continue. He's got the one Stanley Cup. Can you imagine what you'd be talking about Ovi right now with all these goals and not if he didn't have one championship? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Selfish, greedy, all he cared about with his goals. Mm Mm-hmm. Don't turn Austin into that okay. with a 65 or 70. If you t- if if Connor or Nate mm-hmm. had the same mentality of shoot first like Austin's had in his first six or seven, I think they'd probably score 65, 70 goals. They don't, though, because they 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 want more to their game. They yeah. want to facilitate. They want to move year, it. Yes. That's, that's just my point here. Is that like, we get caught up in this seventy and and all of it, and like just back off the guy, and maybe if the Toronto media didn't talk about it every day, seventy goals, maybe actually he would back off trying to shoot everything in sight. Um, Connor doesn't have a cop yet, though, so he can't. And him and Nate to me are not in the same conversation that in that sort of. Thing. But they play, they they. They play the similar type of game where they're out there as a centerman and For sure. controlling and they're unpredictable and they, they make plays and they're what I'd love to know if Connor points, was in this market, points. what you would say about him. Just knowing that Austin is a guy who's on Selkie ballots and leads the league in block shots and the yeah. way he commits in his own end. I'm yeah. curious if you would talk but, about but, McDavid but, but, differently if you saw him every night. But the Leafs don't share the puck mm-hmm. like those teams. No doubt. They don't snap it around. Their power play looks like it's in qu- like quicksand compared to Edmonton's and Colorado's. Boy, that power play. So, oh. so all I know is that those guys have a similar look every night. Mm-hmm. where they're moving the puck and Austin needs to be the, ch- the 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 guy leading the charge so they can push those numbers that you just spoke of moments ago to mm-hmm. me. Like, those are better numbers for him, right? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it, it's looked really good. It's tough for me to tease out what's what, right? You're playing these teams and different lines. Has something changed? Could he play like this more? Maybe. I mean, it would be wonderful if he did. Uh, Tom Wilson. Should mention that before we get the break for... uh... Yeah, called in for an in-person hearing on his uh, stick to Gregor's face. You watch it two or three times and you're like, it it looks bad. Yeah. It looks bad. Yeah. It's one of two things. It either is bad or it's reckless. And he, either way, it's super dumb. He was dumb. very apologetic almost it's after. It's almost like he recognized as soon as he, he did. He put his arm around him. Are you okay? It's like yeah. you very seldom see that. I mean, Kip, he one hand whips his stick across it his was, face. Was he just trying to kind of break away or just trying to swat him away like a fly a little bit and it I got like out of control? he was trying to maybe wrap it around he, his body or something. Listen, he looked right at him. Like the, the, the video was bad. Like he looked at him and wrapped it around and whacked him right in the mouth. Did anything happen prior to that or were they he just... He had just rubbed him out into the boards, like gave him a little body, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's Gregor. I don't think Gregor was jawing at Tom Wilson. What's... Cracked his teeth off. Like it's a... Can't do that. Five games. I guess. Oh, that's that'll dangerous. End. That, that, that ends their push. Oh. <laughs> Put them out of their misery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> provide the pillow to smother the capitals, please. You, you don't think it's you don't think it's a five gamer. It's so. It non- doesn't fit the 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 five game kind of mold for me. It's so not done out of anger, right? No. Like yes, is, it is. 
He just pushed him into the boards and then wrapped his stick around the face and slashed him in the mouth. It, to me, and then you dumb. console him after it's that? Dumb. Oh, I'm so, it's dumb. reckless. It's... I don't think... Come on. They're, There's they're so, in a, so little malice. They're, they're in a play. They took some stupid penalties, too. They're just, they're they're, just horrible they're just last year. They just stink. <laughs> they, stink. they just stink. <laughs> they stink. Okay? But the good news for them is the yeah. Islanders stink, and there's a Florida bunch of... Florida or Boston <laughs> fighting to draw the Capitals is a real fight at the top of the division. It just doesn't follow the narrative of a five-game uh, suspension it's on guys that are supposed to hate each other. I think... Tom Wilson was last suspended in 2021. So I'm sure he, having a history plays into this, right? Like, yeah. Can't do that. All right. Uh, where do you want to go? Uh, I think we got to go to get to TJ Brody, or are we going to take a break and, and come back on those conversations? We also got Craig Simpson. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take a break and then come back. Okay. We, we got you heard here. the boss. Quick word, and we're back on Real Kipper and Born with Craig Simpson. Nick Kipper, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee. We got Simmer. All right, as advertised. Let's welcome in Craig Simpson, former NHLer, two time Stanley Cup champion, Hockey Night Canada. And uh, Derek Brandeo tells me um, he dropped him. Let's call. Let's call a drop. We haven't had too many drops, eh? That's a really good point. Sammy? Yeah. You've you been on a heck of a run. Thank you. I was waiting for that. I mean, we do a lot of Zoom, right? So it's a lot harder for it to drop during Zoom, but. I remember last year, it was bad. You were on a horrible it, I remember I, Kevin Kerr has dropped I, three times when I mostly when enjoy that it, Kip has tied it directly to your performance. Like I, you're holding the call <laughs> physically. <laughs> I think it's fair. I do. Like, honestly, if, if I was in Kipper's chair, I would blame the producer. Too. All right, here we go. Craig Simpson, <laughs> take two. Did you, did you dump me, Kipper, or what? I, I heard you <laughs> for a second, welcomed me in, and then I was gone. Simmer, I blame everything on Sammy. Okay. Whatever. All right. Good job, Sammy. Whatever I can. Listen, um, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, since they moved our our scheduling up, uh, we haven't had you on as often. But when we do, we're so appreciative. Uh, thanks for joining us. How you been, pal? I've been good. Yeah, I've been. Uh, it's good to get down to the fine strokes of the season when you start looking at. Uh, the games left and they start with a one instead of 40 left. Uh, yeah. It starts to get exciting. And I, I've been listening to you guys. I often do on a game day doing the uh, Walker or an off day. And uh, I know it is that kind of time that everything gets exemplified and everybody's looking to the finish line of the regular season to get when it counts the most. So it, it is the most exciting time of the year and, and getting ready for the best time of it. Well, we appreciate it, Simmer. We agree. It is a fun time of year. Um, unfortunately, some decisions need to get made around this time of year, and the Leafs aren't exactly sure in a few places. One of them is Annette. Last night, Joseph Wool gets back in. I thought played pretty yeah. darn good, particularly in the first period. Gives up three. What were your take on his performance last night and the direction for the Leafs in net? Well, his, his performance was, was good. Like, I, I thought he looked calm. He... Uh, he looked better than he did, uh, albeit I know the games. I, I heard you talking about it uh, numerous times about, you know, he got two tough games against the Boston Bruins. So I almost felt, uh, Justin, that, uh, you know, I almost wondered if it was a little bit of an audition saying, hey, if we're going to maybe play the Boston Bruins in the first round, let, let's see how this kid can handle them. And I know it was a challenging time. He had the one game against Arizona where he looked uh, solid in his first game back. But I just didn't think he looked confident. He didn't quite have his his calmness, his swagger, his his energy the same way. But you know, it's a tough position to play when you haven't played much. And so I, I thought, if nothing else, last night he looked like he had good composure in the net. It wasn't a hugely challenging game. Uh, and you, you know, okay, Ovi blasts one uh, over his shoulder there, but Ovi's done that to about 140 goaltenders. So <laughs> it, it's hard to put a whole lot of blame on that. But I, I thought that was a hugely important game for him, though. If he had another night where he gives up four or five on 25 shots like he had against the Bruins, you're, you you can't help yourself if, if you're the coaching staff and looking and say, I'm not sure this guy's going to get to where we need him to be if he's going to be a choice come playoff time. So uh, it, if, if nothing else, it should get him into the uh, rhythm of, 
uh, you know, starting to play, maybe they go one game, one game. I know you got back-to-back games this weekend. I think it'll be really interesting, don't you guys, to say who's the starter on Saturday. I I think that'll tell a lot about what the mindset of the team is. I know it's back-to-back, and you got Carolina the next game, which is an Eastern Conference team, but I I just think that's a marquee game. And is this one where if you see Joseph Wall coming out first, I, I, I think that's a statement, and that, that's something that I'll be really intrigued to see what uh, Sheldon's choice is going to be. Saturday night, the statement may be Max Domi playing alongside Austin Matthews again. <laughs> uh, Simmery had his best game as a Leaf uh, last night against Washington. As, as, a, as, a, as a former winger um, who's expected to, to go up uh, with a, a top line like you have, what would Max have been thinking about or going through on, on the opportunity to play with a guy like Austin Matthews? Well, I think first and foremost, Kip, you know, like I was a center my entire life. I, I never played wing until my third year in the National Hockey League. And goodness me, going from center in the NHL as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old, to suddenly play in wing was like, oh my God, why haven't I been doing this my whole life? <laughs> Such a breeze. This is the easiest thing. So I I really do. If I was Max, and it certainly looked like it, you you know, veteran guys and good players who uh, I heard you talking about, you know, he's a guy who can make instinctive offensive plays. And he can can share the puck with you. He can jump to a hole. He can make the no-look passes. He understands the roots because he's been a centerman. Getting to the wing there, you look at the opportunity to play on the Matthews line. I, I thought he acted like a, a true pro. You know, this is your chance, and he didn't squander it. And he looked comfortable. He looked energized. Uh, I thought early in the year when he did play some wing, he wasn't skating. And and I thought getting him back to center got his legs going again because you do have to skate a whole lot more. you got to do a lot more. And I thought it got the pace of his game up. But last night, he he looked like, oh, man, this is exactly where I want to be, and this is where I'm going to show him that I deserve to be. And I I thought it looked good. And and I really do think that part of the problem of having him at the center position, and I heard you guys talking about, okay, when you get to playoff, and specifically a matchup, whether it's Florida or Boston, I, I don't think you feel all that comfortable that, that he can do the layman's work in his own zone at that center position. I honestly do think he can do it on the wing, though, and, and, and that's a much more comfortable position. And if it frees up somebody else to play a different role on a line uh, down the line uh, and he gets good you know, chemistry with Matthews, I, I do think it's a really viable option. And I think they'd be nuts not to have him there on Saturday. Uh, you know, even if Mitch Marner does make an appearance, I think it's worth another look. For sure. And so a lot of this is like getting guys to their best selves, to find a way to put them in a position to succeed and then to get them, you know, feeling confident heading into postseason. One guy who didn't play last night, TJ Brody. They they healthy scratched him. First time I can remember it happening as a Toronto yeah. Maple Leaf. You know, do you feel like this season is salvageable? Is this a confidence thing? Has he just slowed down with age? What are we looking at for the viability of him as a guy who has been a great shutdown player for the Leafs? Yeah, I, I, I you know, you're a little surprised that, okay, here he's a, he's a healthy scratch. Uh, I, I think it was the right time mm-hmm. uh, against an opponent that you weren't all that concerned about. I think it was really important to get uh, Timmons. You know, Timmons to me is, you talk about a bad luck year for him. He, he's twice, you know, had an injury and then sickness that he would have probably had an opportunity to prove he can play and maybe play a little bit of a more significant role. So uh, I thought that was the right time to do it. Uh, I was just looking, you know, TJ's gone through the wild stretches when, when, uh, when uh, Riley went out with the suspension, you know, he went on a good run. He was minus four in the last two was plus four in the two prior to that and minus eight in the previous eight. That tells you it's just you don't have consistency. You know, I I know it's an arbitrary stat a little bit, the plus minus, but he's also been in a position where he's played 23 straight games of 20 minutes or more. And quite frankly, you know, maybe sitting in the stands and getting a little mental break, getting a little physical break will probably do him some good. You know, the question is, 
is it more than one game or is it just the one and it maybe gets him centered again and, and gets him maybe digging in as a good veteran would having sat in the press box. And, you know, I, I think he's a real pro. He's a salvageable guy, but uh, there's no question that the inconsistency in his game has just been there. And I think it was the right thing to do and the right time to, to give him a, a chance to sit up top and have a look at the game from a different perspective. Simmer, we, we know what uh, the big boys are going to have to do come game one in the Stanley Cup playoffs, but where are you on the, the secondary part here in the development of, uh, of McMahon and, and Holmberg and uh, where, where Robertson fits in and what, what can Sheldon get out of them in the next dozen games or so to prep them for going up against a, a Florida or a Boston? Yeah, I think you got to push them to, to get them some more ice time. And, you know, the hardest thing to do uh, as a coach is to, to just get the trust to a level that you just say, you know what, we don't really have another option. And so I've got to trust that these guys uh, can play their best. You know, I, I look at, for, for me, guys, uh, I, I know I was an 18-year-old in the NHL, so uh, by the time I got to 20, 21, I, I had a lot of experience. I've gone through some hard knocks and learned how to play. My, my best hockey in my entire life was as a 20, 21-year-old and a 22, 23-year-old, the best I've ever played. And so it's, it's not unusual for young guys to you know, be oblivious to the pressure and just uh, uh, embrace the opportunity that's there. But the hardest part for a coaching staff is, is to have that, you know, sometimes it's just out of necessity that there are no other options. So you have to get the trust factor to a level that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. And quite frankly, guys, sometimes I think that's the absolutely best thing that can happen. You know, sometimes the coaches need to get out of their way a little bit as, as well. And I was talking to Chris Cuthbert about it the last few days, as you guys have been juggling the lines you know, my, my experience with Craig McTavish coaching staff in Edmonton when I was assistant coach, you'd sit in the coach's room with the whiteboard and your lines up there with the magnets. And you'd say, we, you know, this line's killing us. So you start moving a player here and there and you look at that line that maybe it's a number, it's a third line and go, oh my gosh, that's a great lineup. That looks perfect. But the problem is you look at that second line or the fourth line and go, but I can't play that line. I can't play that line. So anytime you do those little moves with, with one player on a line or two guys around, so often, I, I can tell you how many discussions we had as a coaching staff where you go, God, I love this line, but it ruins our other two. And I think that's what the, the experiment has been like for the Leafs during this little stretch is – you, you put one together and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that looks good. And maybe we got two solid lines of scoring here, but then you can't play the fourth line against anybody. They're, they, you know, they're just, it, it, that's the, the challenge you have. And I agree with what you guys are saying that now is the time to do a little experimenting. But I also think, you, you know, Bobby McMahon for me is a guy that has grown in leaps and bounds in the last uh, two, three, four weeks. He looks like a player now. He looks like it's, he's playing at a different speed. His mind is thinking the game at a higher speed. And I honestly think that, you know, look around the lineup and say, you're going to need a big body who can get in there. And yeah. when he gets skating, it looks like he's skating down a hill. You know, he, he, his speed has really improved. And I go, you're going to need a guy like that. So you got to get him to the point where he feels like he can be trusted to make plays. He's going to turn the puck over. So what? How many times does Nylander turn it over or Marner? Mm -hmm. Like the best players are the biggest giveaway guys in your lineup because they have the puck all the time. So yeah, you have to accept that the younger guys are going to make some mistakes, but you also have to empower them to say you're important and we're going to need you. Like we need somebody coming in like a Fernando Persani for us in 2006 mm -hmm. and say, scores almost as many goals in the playoffs as he did in the regular season. And why can't a guy like that do it? Yeah. It's funny. I, I don't think there's a bigger compliment to a hockey player than say that guy's a line fixer. You know, whatever line yeah. you put him on, that line gets better. And McMahon feels like that to me right now. Like you're okay with wherever he goes. He seems to help them out a little bit. Um, 
on the back end right now, they don't seem to have pairs. How have you felt about the new additions of Labushkin and Edmondson and how this group is going to look heading into their first round series? Yeah, that that is that's that's a, that's the sixty three million dollar question. Right. Is, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, Labushkin, I, I think you you kind of know what you're going to get with him, and he's an honest guy and he works hard. So you're going to have to live with some mistakes. You're going to have to live with some turnovers, but I think you'll probably find as the games get bigger and get grittier, he's a guy that you can lean on because you're conscious that he's going to battle hard for you and he's going to give you everything you got. I think Edmondson is finding his way of where do I fit in this lineup? Who's going to be my partner? Uh, To me, a guy like that really needs somebody who is, you know, a good communicator so that they can use the, the veteran presence that they have to, to work their way around as a pair and support each other and know where you're going to be the outlet. I don't think he's totally comfortable yet, but I think he should be able to find a way to get in there. Um, I, I just, I don't think there's any set pairs right now, guys. And if, and if you can't go back or you're worried about going back to a, a Riley and Brody pairing and, and saying, geez, that maybe can't work then that even makes it more complicated. But, uh, you know, to, to me, a guy like, you know, I, I like the McCabe-Benoit pairing for most of the time that they played together. And I, I'll be interested to see if he just finally goes back and said, you know, they're not perfect. They're probably, although McCabe's had a career year uh, goal-wise and point-wise, but they're probably not a huge offensive threat. But there's another example of, I, I just want to know that when we get into battling Barkov or battling Bennett and, you know, having to deal with Kachuk going to the net, that you got at least two pairs that can be physical and be hard. And they're going to make some mistakes. They may not get you a whole lot of offense, but you got to be able to stop a cycle. You got to be able to take a body down to, to end an offensive zone shift and get the puck out. And, you know, those are sort of key guys that are going to fi- have to find some chemistry with whomever they get in and find a way to, to play at a successful level. Simmer, we only got a, a few minutes here. I have to ask you because I really value your opinion on this, and this is Ovi's pursuit of Wayne's record here. And I think the Washington Capitals are in a bit of a, a – between a rock and a hard place here. They're, they're chasing a playoff spot. Yet yeah. you've got young kids there like McMichael, Strom, and I'm just wondering, you know, Lapierre, the the pressure that they feel every night to get OV the puck. Is it real? Well, I, I think it's instinctively. I, I listen. I, I heard you say about Strom. I don't know if you had listened. You probably have me on mute when you're watching the game. So <laughs> I was uh, I was doing the replay, and I'm going like I'm watching, going, how is he not shooting? He's yes. right there. And from Wall, it's almost like Wall – You know, he knows Ovechkin's on the side, but the guy's right down the gut. So I think there is a little, you know, they're humans and they're young kids and they're going to defer to a guy who's been the best scorer in the league for, you know, 19 years. And so I I do think it can be disruptive, but I also think the onus is going to be on Ovechkin to say, I think the way he's playing and feeling now that the goals are going in, I think it's calmed his demeanor down a little bit I think even Spencer was saying you know he's he's more like the captain now and he's brought the energy you know that was Ovi at the beginning of the game hitting every chance he got and and that's where when the Washington Capitals were a threat of a team that's the Ovechkin that you sort of fear and that gets the game going and gets the team going so you hope it doesn't become you know a dog and pony show where it's all about just trying to set him up around but I I don't think there's any question Nick that the younger guys will feel a little pressure of it I think the challenge for for both Carvery and talking with Ovechkin is saying guys we got to develop and make sure we don't drop off as a team and if we don't I think it's inevitable that Ovechkin's going to get there hey Simmer great stuff as always always love having you on the show thanks for doing this all right guys take care thanks Simmer appreciate it it's Craig Simpson hockey night Canada analyst two-time Stanley Cup champion yeah, it's real for sure. Yeah, he like said that, they don't that, want to be that a was... dog and pony show. There's some dogs. Wow. There's some ponies. Then maybe they're not coordinated into full on circus yet. All we're, right, we're, we're getting there. We're just getting started here on the Real Kipper and Born Show. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Dan Murphy, host of Hockey Night in Canada, Canucks Hockey on Sportsnet. We'll get into whether or not an eight point lead is enough for Vancouver to hold on, or the Edmonton Oilers coming on strong. 
That and so much more still to go on the Real Kipper and Born show. Don't go away. We are a go, Derek Brandeo tells me, for our national hour here on the Real Kipper and Born show. Glad you're along. We're live on Sportsnet, Sportsnet 650 in Vancouver, Sportsnet 960 in Calgary. As always, this hour of Real Kipper and Bourne brought to you by Bet365, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee, and yours truly here. I'm going to welcome in Dan Murphy, host of Hockey Night in Canada, Sportsnet. Huge game for Borne's Islanders tonight. Massive, massive I mean, game. Doesn't make it necessarily watchable between those two teams, but it's a big one. <laughs> Seven games on tap. More, more than that, isn't there? Seven, no? Hmm. How many? You did the lineup. Well, maybe you're right. <laughs> Seven. Okay. And I'm the one that retired with a concussion. <laughs> All right. That makes a lot of sense. Let's welcome in Dan Murphy to our show as uh, the Vancouver Canucks are set to host the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, sporting for those of you that cannot watch him on Zoom, a Grizzlies hat. That's a collector's item, is That's it not? That's a big country Reeves original right there. So do you guys know that I, uh, I before I did Canucks hosting, I hosted one season of Grizzlies basketball. How'd you do? Were you What's good? That? He got the franchise folded. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> did they really leave early. because of you? <laughs> that was, yeah, it wasn't my fault, but um, it was the early days. Bibby, Dickerson, Sharif, Big Country, Othello, Harrington, Grant Long. Man, the names I could I could give you. But yeah, one year of Grizzlies basketball. All right. Um we got, what, 13 games to go in the Vancouver Canucks season. They've got a comfortable lead over the Edmonton Oilers, or do we look at the games in hand? What's the feeling out there? Um, I, I mean, I think it's not comfortable. Uh, they're, what, eight points up. I think they have the tiebreaker, so that makes them, you know, Evans has got to clear nine points. Uh, but they do have one game head-to-head, -head, so it could get interesting. But I, am, I guess what you're playing for at this point, they're not going to play Edmonton in the first round. Um, you're looking at either LA, Vegas, or Nashville, depending de depending on how things break. So I don't think they're too too worried about uh, winning the division. Of, of course, they'd like to. Uh, I think it's just more trying to get back to playing solid hockey and getting back on top of their game because it's been a bit of a lull here since the All Star break. You know, it's funny you say that it's been a bit of a lull just going back over their schedule, but you know, prepping to interview with you in in March, they have won the majority of their hockey games, and it seems like maybe squeaking by a little bit more than they would like like to. What is the state of their play on the ice these days? Yeah, I mean, I, when I say that it's been a lull, I mean the twenty games, the last twenty games are ten, seven, and three. So if the the tough point of your season, you're still playing at a ninety point pace. Yeah, that's pretty good, right? But, you know, the things that have, you know, the offense five on five has dried up a little bit. And that's not surprising. The team was shooting like 13 and a half percent in the first half of the season. That wasn't continue. continue. Um, I, I think, you know, overall, the defensive game has been really good uh, since the All-Star break. I think they're allowing the fewest shots per game. Um, you know, defensively, they've been solid. But, you know, there, there's some areas that I think that could improve. Uh, the power play finally looked good in their last game. It had been really sputtering. Elias Pettersson, you know, his offense had dried up a little bit. Um, so I think those are the kind of things they're, they're trying to focus on. He's still got 82 points this season. But they do have to figure out what the top six is going to look like before the playoffs because it's been, you know, an ongoing audition of wingers for uh, both, you know, Miller and Besser on that line and then with Pettersson. Um, I think when they got, you know, Lindholm at the dead, before the deadline, I think they were hoping that that would be the guy you could play with, with Pettersson. That hasn't worked out so far. Mm -hmm. I don't think they had, you know, Lindholm, Settering, Lafferty, and Mikheyev, which is what the line is tonight, in their mind when they made that trade. So I still think there's stuff to figure out before the playoffs. Just, you know, makeup of this lineup. We're talking to Dan Murphy, host of Hockey Night in Canada and Canucks Hockey on Sportsnet. You mentioned uh, Patterson, two goals and an assist against uh, Buffalo. What is life been like for for Patterson after signing the massive contract in terms of uh expectations amongst uh, the fan base because as as Sammy here in out east has reminded me since Willie Nylander signed his massive contract not quite the same player that he was in the first half of the season how's it been for Petey 
I mean, I think the, the, the fans have been on him a little bit, uh, you know, kind of February on. He scored 14 goals in January. I believe he was the leading goal scorer in the league. So, you know, it's not like he's having a poor season. He's already had 82 points. But, you know, we, have, we haven't we have seen recently as many of those games that he takes over, you know, where the offense, um, you know, has just been, you know, he can, he can change the pace of the game. And that hasn't happened as much. The last game was much better. And I will say this, I think part of it has to do with the fact that they haven't been able to find him consistent wingers. Um, so, you know, the, the Patterson we saw in the first half of the season has is, is been gone a little bit here, but I, I don't think it's the contract. Um, you know, a lot of people say, you know, what about this guy and his personality? And I said, well, if he chose to sign in Vancouver for eight more years, I think his personality is going to be just fine to, to play here and accept the criticism because he knows what it's like. So I wouldn't say that the, the contract has been the reason for the dip in play recently. I think it's just been, you know, one of those lulls in the season. You know, we do a Leafs hour earlier. Um, you know, before this one, we t- end up talking about contracts pretty much 90% of the time and everyone <laughs> hates it. I don't know why we do it. Money, but let's money, try money. it in Vancouver and see if they like it. How are things with Philip Fronick, where he's at, what he should be worth? Where's that conversation at these days out West? Well, he's a restricted free agent, uh, as we know. And now that Pedersen's done, the, the focus shifts to that. And, you know, he's in line for a massive raise. So, I guess the question is, um, you know, how much can you pay him? And how much is he a product of playing with Quinn Hughes? Right. I mean, that's the big question, right? Alan Walsh is going to go in and say, here's a 55-point season, 60-point season for defensemen somewhere in there, leading the league in plus minus and primary assists and, you know, on ice uh, goals for it, even strength. They're going to want a big race. And the Canucks are going to say, hold on a second. You know, if we paired him on his own pairing, uh, if we had to give him a pairing of his own, would he be able to lead it? So that, they're going to have to find the sweet spot. Does Hronik like the situation he's in here? Um, and it's not just, you can't just say, you just play him with Quinn Hughes, anybody can do it. Not anybody can do it. You have to skate with him. You have to think the game like him. And I think he's been a you know a really, really good a partner for Quinn. Um, you know, I think it's going to land somewhere just north of seven, um, you know, which is making more than Quinn right now. But, of course, the cap's going up. So I, I think they'll get it done. They paid a first and a second to get this guy. They're not going to let him walk. But I think it is going to be a tough negotiation because Al Walsh is not going to want to take a, a discount for the numbers he's putting up. Speaking of Quinn Hughes, pretty good body check uh, Tuesday night <laughs> against Buffalo. And just the sense that uh, his game seems to be strong enough to to finish this season off and and, and win a Norris. Your thoughts yeah. on, on, on Quinn and, and, and the strength that he's showing down the stretch here? I think he's the best player in the Canucks, and it's not particularly close. Um, you know, it's, we've almost become desensitized to the stuff that he does out here on a nightly basis, on a game-by-game basis. If he has a bad game, they're so rare it sticks out, right? If there's a game where he's slightly off, you're like, oh, that was a bad night for him. You say it once every month, if that. Um, you know, you know, as you prepare for these games, you get the stat packs, and it's like every single game, it's like Quinn Hughes with this assist has joined Bobby Orr and Paul Coffey to do that. Yeah. He's where he's with Kit. Like any of the, the people he's mentioning for some of these numbers are the best of the best of the best. And Kale McCarr's off in, in a lot of those as well. He has been um, excellent. You know, I really, as soon as Tockett came in last year and said, we need our young guys to lead, we need Pedersen and Hughes to step up, as soon as he said that, something switched in Quinn Hughes. I, I, I think. You know, I often think to myself now, he probably thought I'm going to be the captain. Like, I'm going to take the bull by the horns, and I'm going to make them notice me, and I'm going to be the captain of this team. And he's done it. And like I said, no disrespect to Pedersen or Demko or Miller. I just think that, uh, you know, where, where M- Miller's the emotional heartbeat of the team, I think, I just think that the best player in this team is the captain. And this season, he's been fantastic. So we've talked a little bit about the tent pole guys there who have moved the needle to have this team, you know, favorites to win the division and should win the division here uh, when it's all said and done. We haven't talked to you in a while and not since the deadline. We were talking before the show, and so I have to ask you, what happened with the Phil Kessel thing at the deadline? Well, why, how did that end up falling th- through? I never did get a scoop on that. Uh, I mean, I think, I think they sent him to Abbotsford to see what he looked like. I think the plan was to sign him and then have him like break glass in case of emergency if they needed right. some depth scoring. Um, and my guess is that, you know, um, maybe they didn't like what they saw or didn't see what they expected to see. And Alvin said something to the effect of, you know, we don't think he fits our style of play. And that's why we didn't sign him. 
So I just think probably when they brought him out for an extended look, they decided in the end, you know, spending that money was not uh, what they intended to do or, or there was no path forward for him to play on this team, even if they had a couple of injuries. So that's my guess why, why that fell through. You know, a term that we often use in the playoffs uh, to talk about uh, role players or, or foot soldiers here, and particularly McKay, of a guy that uh, uh, we know here uh, out east a lot uh, through his Toronto days. Is it, it, is it 34 games he went without a goal? 30-some. 30, 30 I can't remember what the – yeah, 34, I think. He yeah. Went. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, you, and you guys know, like, this is a guy that, you know – never finishes on a high percentage of his chances. You know, he's kind of like the, you know, the next coming of Grabner with getting breakaways and, and, you know, finishing one out of every 10 kind of, mm -hmm. kind of thing. But he was really struggling. Um, and the speed wasn't there. I don't know if the confidence in his knee after the surgery was, was there. Uh, but I will say over the past three weeks and especially into the last game, he's looked way better and that has to be you know just a, a huge sigh of relief for rick talkett i mean they they want this guy killing penalties they need this guy's profile they need the speed uh they really only have a couple of burners on this team he'd be one and lafferty would be another um so yes yeah, so i think he went through a crisis of confidence more than anything um he wasn't scoring when he was in the top six he wasn't scoring in the bottom six but he has he's one of those players that has been definitely trending in the right direction so the best season by a Canuck here, like if a guy who's maybe most above expectations, well, I may not say that he had high expectations, but JT Miller uh, is Rick yeah. Tockett had just kind of like the Miller whisper, the way he was a Kessel whisper. Do they have a special connection? They, he sure got a lot out of him this year. Yeah. I, I, like you guys might be able to explain it better than me. I, I think some guys want to be coached mm -hmm. and I think he's one of those players. He wants to be challenged. He wants to be, told things he wants to be taught he wants to discuss everything and i think he needed to be coached uh he needed like like a firm hand so to speak and uh he doesn't care at all if he's held accountable if he does something stupid he wants that so i just think that talk has been the right fit for his personality and his style of play um you know i, I think that uh he wants to win badly and sometimes in the past uh that manifested in you know some outbursts that probably he's not you know real proud of but we haven't seen that much this year and maybe because the team is winning a lot more and he hasn't been as frustrated but i just think it's been a perfect match of player and coach for for a guy that uh you know a guy like talk he's got a lot of equity with hockey players right with the way he played and how hard he played and the style he played and i think that resonates with a guy like like gt murph just to take you out of the pacific for a second uh, is there a lot of talk out west on 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 the season that Winnipeg's having because the focus all season long has been pretty much, you know, the, at least the big tech ticket items have coming out of, uh, uh, Vancouver and Edmonton, but like Winnipeg now is a real legitimate contender in my opinion. Yeah. And, and who would have thought that, I mean, at the end of last season, of course, nobody thought the Canucks would be, you know, but maybe challenging for a playoff spot, but not where they are now. And with remember how it finished with Winnipeg and Rick Bonus blowing up at his team yeah. in the playoffs. Like yeah. who would have thought to come back like this and have this type of season? Um, I love Rick. I'm I'm so happy for him. And and I I don't get a vote for these types of things, but I would probably have Connor Hellebuck in the top three of heart voting yeah. for me. When I look at the numbers, I um, mean, I know it's not a, a thing we do anymore. Um, you know, I don't even know who the last one was. Was it Carey Price or Jose okay. Theodore? I can't remember. Um, but I think he deserves to be there. His numbers underlying and, and counting stats, whatever you want, are so far above any other goaltender. Uh, it's crazy. So I think just the fact that you've got him uh, makes him a legitimate threat. A hot a series can win you a cup and there's none better in the league right now than hell of a so you know talking about other other teams you know you wouldn't potentially have to face winnipeg for a couple of rounds you could potentially face vegas who just did a whole bunch of stuff to get a whole bunch of players is that the worst case scenario for for the canucks or maybe you not believe in what they're selling out there um, I don't know if it'd be worst case. I think the fans, it'd, it'd be the, the sky is falling. Why is this happening yeah. to us type of thing? But after that start, the first 20 games, I mean, Vegas is 500 team. I know they've had a ton of injuries they, without Eichel for a month and uh, Theodore was out and Petrangelo has been out and now Stone's out. 
I think if they were fully healthy, then you'd say why. Mm -hmm. But, you know, are they just what they are right now until they get healthy, um, which has been a 500 team? So I don't think they have that same mystique as they did in years past with the Canucks. Like, the Canucks couldn't beat them. It, the, like, the two teams Vancouver can ever beat was Winnipeg and Vegas. Um, and so, uh, but I think the mystique around both those teams has gone a little bit now with this version of the Canucks. So, yeah, listen, on a personal level, I get to go to either LA <laughs> or Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't care. <laughs> do, do you think though that miraculously, if uh, everyone's healthy for game one against Vegas, that there's not going to be this psychological uh, effect on, uh Oh, of course, I think there's going to be a bit of an uh-oh. I mean, look at Vancouver's roster. There's not a lot of guys that have been there in the playoffs. I mean, aside from the bubble, a little slight bubble run there with Pedersen and Hughes and some and Demko, right? They're, I mean, they haven't had a home playoff game since 2015, right? Wow. Like that Alex Burroughs was right. doing a conference yesterday as a coach uh, for Montreal. And I was thinking, man, the last time they had a home playoff game, he was playing for the Vancouver Canucks. So, because the bubble, of course, is in Edmonton. Yeah. So I think that, you know, these players, the, the coaching staff's going to have to do a good job of getting prepared for this. But, of course, if Vegas is fully healthy, they're going to go, oh, my God, look at the, look at this lineup. But also, you could also say, look at the goaltending um, for the last half of the season. It hasn't been great. So I, I, I get a sense there's a little more mental fortitude with this group that hasn't been there in the past. Maybe that's just the product of winning a lot of games this year. You know, whatever comes of this season for the Canucks, I know it would be selling it short to say whatever happens is a success because it's not. I understand expectations have changed from the start of the year, but it's a success in that where they were going to where they are now is you've charted a totally different course. So looking past this season, how are they positioned to continue to be this team and not re revert back to the one they were? Like, are they going to re-sign Elias Lindholm? How do you think it looks in the future going forward here? Well, they've got a lot of UFAs, um, like, and, and most notably, we talked about Ronick. You also have Dakota Joshua. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you look at Teddy Bluger. There are some players, you know, Casey DeSmith, some players they'd probably like to have back that they, they won't be able to get. I think their setup's still fine uh, for the mere fact that now Pedersen is locked up long term. You've got Quinn Hughes at a ridiculous number for a few more years. You've got Denko for one more year uh, after this one. So the core pieces are still there. Yeah. And I would say that. This management group uh, has identified the right players, and that's something the last management group couldn't do. Like, they rarely hit on a trade or an acquisition or free agent signing, rarely. And this one really hasn't missed, I don't think. So I think that they're set up because their core is signed. Um, they've got a functioning NHL defense, which they hadn't had in years. Um, and Susie is, is coming back next year. He's got two years left. And I think this management group has done uh, has proven itself of able to find the next guy instead of signing the old guy that was just doing it. So, um, you know, I, I think those are the reasons why fans should be, you know, optimistic for next year. Maybe not challenging for a president's trophy, uh, but, you know, I don't think anybody thought they'd be doing that this year either. About that decor, are you surprised to see OEL having so much success in Florida? <laughs> You know what? I, maybe a little bit, yeah. but here's the thing. Like, and I say this about Chris Tanev. When Chris Tanev left here, um, you know, everybody was like, oh, he might be washed, right? Yeah. And I was like, I don't know if he's washed, but for the last six years, he's been so beat up because he's defended every game and he doesn't care about taking a hit to make a play. He was retrieving every puck. He was taking every four check. He was broken down. They never had the puck for a decade. This team never had the puck. <laughs> then he went to Calgary and it was a good team and look at him. And now he's, you know, back to being the Chris Tanev. So I think that OEL was dogged a bit. He was he was not always healthy. And then just the trade that brought him here, like he was always going to be on his back foot with a fan base. So I'm, I'm happy he's having that success because he wasn't really set up for success in this market. Merv, uh, just one more uh, on on uh, the list of UFAs and, and Lynn Holm in particular. Is yeah. his long-term future as a Canuck co completely hinge on on the success of uh, the playoffs for him and the team? Yeah, I would say yes. Uh, Talkett uh, alluded to the fact he's battling through something right now, an injury. I'm not sure what he said it wasn't serious, so maybe that's why his offensive numbers haven't been that great since the trade. Um, I, I don't know. Like Again, I don't know. Can they afford him? Can you afford to have JT at 
eight million, uh, Pedersen at eleven million, and then another center making eight million. I don't know. I, I just don't know if he's going to be a fit financially. That's just my thought right now. But heck, if they go on a long run and and you know they make it to the third round or of the playoffs or conference finals, and he's a big part of it, then maybe they make a push to do it. I just think it's going to be really tough to fit him in financially. Dan, great stuff, man. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the game tonight. And uh, go Grizzlies, go. <laughs> go Lawrence Moten. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Murph. Appreciate it. All right, Dan Murphy. Go tee it up at Shaughnessy. Canucks hockey on Sportsnet, Hockey Night in Canada. He was fun. He's a good guy. He is. And also very good golfer. He's probably golfing. It's probably nice in BC, right? Is it not? Cold here today, boy. It is. Feels like sucks wait, today. There's some dead tulips in my front garden. I can tell you that. It actually feels the coldest it's been all winter in March. <laughs> it's, it's it's a mindset very, thing though. It, you were you're not not ready for it. We had a great winter here. Wasn't that yeah. bad? Oh, it was awesome. And then it just kind of got cold at the worst possible time. Not great. They don't have to win the Stanley Cup. I don't think they even have to get to a conference got final. Around, though. No, not only that, but you you got to have enough experience that the the group can learn and and. It's, what's the term? Grow thicker skin, you know, through it. So you're battle tested the next time yeah. you come around again. But they, yeah, you know, they probably should win around and have a very good second round to have people believe that uh, they're heading in the right direction with mm -hmm. this group. It is funny, like, you know, having seen the the Leafs struggle to break through for so long, they win around, and everyone's talking about growth. And now they get deeper in the playoffs, and then they get turfed in the next round. And it almost like, voided it right stunted did, the growth yeah it was like there was no you can't just get into that next round and lay down and this is a team that's going to win their division unlike with the, where the leafs yeah. were so you need expectations rounds. will be you need not a round yeah you need weeks you need of hockey. a month we need yeah. to be talking about you know the late may yeah. we need to be talking about the leafs hockey or canucks yeah. hockey in late may but the, the canucks in particular if they do draw a nashville or a los angeles they would be heavy favorites to, you know, and that's one responsibility there. But then after that, you're looking at the Oilers or Vegas. Or, and then after that, it's Colorado or Winnipeg. So, you know, it gets real hard real quick out west. I'm not so sure that Nashville team is a real prize to win yeah, your division. Yeah, but I mean, by standards of NHL playoffs, you never really get a dog. There's not too many bad uh, unless, to unless the first overall, except the first overall team in the East this year. Yes, it's going gonna to get it. They're going to get a dog. Here's the you Caps know, or the Isles of the and, and I know it's a bit of a snail's pace in the East right now, but you, you got to have a overall a, a good season to you make the it. playoffs. Yeah. Like, yeah. Half the league makes it. Yeah. That's it's hard. The, the Islanders are probably the worst of, if you had to draw Detroit, Washington, or the Islanders, Islanders got to be the worst draw because Sorokin is the best goalie of the bunch there. Um, you know, they got a bunch of veterans, some good D, Barzal, Horvat. Like, they they could they could push a, a team. Any team that sneaks in, yeah. as the Panthers proved last year, yeah. can be dangerous. We'll have a shot. They would have had pockets of okay. of good hockey during the regular season that they can yeah. uh, resort to. They can also remember the Wings are 2-8-0 in their last 10. And, you know. Yeah, Not not to make it about the Leafs and the National Honor, we're just talking about the Predators, and we're talking about how the Leafs are having a tough time with centers. Ryan O'Reilly would have been a good fit. Ryan O'Reilly, yeah, we had Paul Maurice on yesterday. If you didn't listen to Paul Maurice on oh, our yeah. show yesterday, go listen to that interview. Yes. But that is one of the things really we talked good. about, his matchups and lineups and trying to... And, and benching having... Rod Brindamore, yes. who's still mad at him. Yes. And he didn't bench Rod Brindamore two games in a row, did he? Oh. Like Sean Couturier? Uh, let's do we'll, game time. We'll then we can that. talk to that Let's do about. game time. Uh, let me get my sheets ready here. It's game time presented by Bet365. Visit the app's latest odds and find out why it's never ordinary. at Bet365 must be 19 plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. Now, I'm sure Bet365 is a very busy place today as today is the first day of March Madness. Uh, the NCAA men's basketball tournament got underway today, which, uh, to me, it's not a great product. Everyone, it's a really romantic time of the year. Everyone gets really excited about it. There's nonstop basketball and ball all. It's not a sports net property, is it? No. Yeah, it's unwatchable. It's just, <laughs> I can't, I can't tell you 
how much worse it is than the pros. They just these guys can't make a shot. They turn the ball <laughs> over. It's not nearly as good, but it's a fun time for everybody. So it I'm sure is. There, I'm sure there's a ton of people Who's not visiting in the pool? Bet three six five. Yeah, uh, I, hey, I I lit. 40 bucks on fire. I'm in two different pools, so I'm ready to rock. Oh, yeah. yeah. One of them, you can win a lot of money, but I won't. Uh, anyways, just thought I'd mention that for my uh, degenerates out there that are hammering on the March Madness. Uh, as far as the NHL slate goes tonight, there's a few good games tonight. I mean, the Red Wings and Islanders is a big game, but I don't think it's a good game. It's a big game, but they're both minus 110. Yes. They have no idea. There's the rest of the games. They, a different sheets. Yes, yeah, so I said seven, and there's like eleven, and you're right. like, well, I don't know how many. Well, no, there are. I, well, you I printed have, it. Yeah, but I was. <laughs> okay, for now on, print them all on one page. Okay, because I'm a little messy this over is, here. I'm not a professional host. Behind the scenes, uh, real Kipper uh, and born. I, you're not a professional. You're extremely professional. But yeah, there's eleven games, and I even wrote that in the lineup. I think that there's eleven games. Yeah, eleven games. Um, but the Islanders, Red Wings, I don't know. Who the hell is going to win this game? I literally have no lean whatsoever. Well, what do the experts say? Red Wings are at home. Who's favorite? It's my, both minus 110. Minus 110. Even even money tonight, either way. They have no idea. So, I got the Isles. <laughs> what a stunning I, They're a better team, that's all. Not, not a... You think they're better? I do. Larkin is coming back after, what, yeah. missing eight games? Yeah, he's coming back tonight, maybe. He'll help. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the no. other, I mean, yeah, he's a good player. Pom-poms out. The <laughs> the other game I have my eye on oh, yeah. is the Rangers and Bruins tonight, which is a great game, good original six matchup, awesome jersey yeah. battle. Uh, the Boston Bruins are very heavy favorites, minus 155 on home ice. Uh, the Rangers plus 130. As you know, I like to get good teams as big underdogs. Give me the Rangers good pick. Good uh, pick. against the Boston Bruins. Um, Bruins and are fraudulent. Another good one. A few good games tonight, boys. The Nashville Predators, the red-hot Nashville Predators that Borny doesn't believe in, are in Florida to take on the Panthers. Um, Panthers, huge favorites, as you would imagine. But the uh, Predators have been hot. They've won three in a row. They're 8-0-2 in their last 10. They're plus 150. Give me the Predators to upset the Florida Panthers. Colton Sissons, and, Tommy Novak, And to shove Kevin it in Borny's face, who doesn't believe in the hottest team in the NHL. Give me the Predators meow. What kind of sound do they make? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'll give Brunette credit. They play an organized, fast brand of hockey. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and? Well, they don't have, they have much talent. They have a great talent. goalie. They don't have much talent. They have a great goalie. Sure. And so when you can print the shirts of the National Predators uh, Stanley Cup Championship, they can print a shirt that has the sphere on it. They can show the DVD at the sphere. Yes. And uh, yes. all as well. They'll, they'll all go to the sphere when they win the Stanley Cup. I like it. Okay. That was game time presented by Bet365. Visit the app for latest odds. To find out why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 19 plus. Ontario only. Please play responsibly. All right. So I'm not a, a huge NCAA basketball guy. Okay. I don't really follow it. I mm -hmm. entered one pool. Uh, Through darts blind no, or what? No, it was a sports app. Uh, pool we did, I think, I don't know, 2006, 2007. Okay. And I have no yeah, idea. Man. So my wife's from Gainesville, Florida, yeah. mm -hmm. home of the Gators. Oh, yeah. She's a Gator girl. I've been there. I pick the Gators to win the championship. Yeah. Cash that check. Cha-ching. <laughs> love it. Yes, and everybody's like, how did you know? You're like, oh, you didn't how did I love you the way know? they rotate. Oh, my God. I love their Just... spacing on the offensive side. I mean, not Are to... they tough under the basket? Not to discredit you, but that's literally one of the greatest college basketball <laughs> teams of all time. It was like, it was Joaquin Noah. Yes. And, uh, what was the other guy in that yes. team? Guy play played uh, Al Horford. Like, they were a okay. absolute yeah, Who doesn't remember Good. the 06 so, Gators I knew. lineup? I, okay. Anyways, my, my cousin went to uh, Florida University. I've been to the Swamp. Oh, yeah. I love it down there. It's, it's a great town. He's really taking cool. ownership of the Gators. I do. I, I root for the Gators because of that. So, go Gators. There you go. Go Iowa. Go All Kevin right. Clark. When we come back, we'll discuss one of 11 games on tap, including the Flyers at Carolina. And guess who's a healthy scratch again? This is the story that just keeps on <laughs> okay. giving. Is it Cam Atkinson? Uh, Bobby have Brink to wait. the lineup? Okay. You'll have to wait <laughs> okay. till after the break. More real Kipper and Bourne. After these words, Nick Kiprio, Justin Bourne, Sammy McKee. Sammy, how far are we away from uh, Blue Jays' opening pitch here? Uh, we a week today. A week today. 
We will not be here a week today. We have the day off. We're getting bumped for Major League Baseball? I mean, I ain't complaining. The nerve. And, you know, they talk about the dog days in baseball. It's the dog days in hockey. I'll take one off. <laughs> That's it. Three weeks till playoffs. Well, yeah. you know, got to watch yeah. the Jays start of the season. I know we touched on this a little uh, earlier today, but uh, Tom Wilson, in-person hearing. Yeah. For this one kind of was... Doofus. Was, usually with in-person hearings, there is this massive wave of social media mm -hmm. emotion no this it's just the leafs aren't involved in it so this one just it's not that much well they're involved this one slid right by because well, again one, this one caught everybody out of left it's field the most violent malice free play i've ever seen like he's just whips his hockey stick at a guy's face and seems indifferent he's just like oh it, whoops my bad if a leaf player did this uh everybody from every other fan base throw him in jail <laughs> kick him off the tour doug <laughs> Like, there'd be no suspended. <laughs> there'd be no. <laughs> That's all. It's your reference. The, uh, but no, it's. Uh, I mean, I don't know what you thought, Kip. We mentioned it a little bit in the first hour, but like bad play, dumb play. It's either reckless or it's violent or some, but it's not. Every once in a while, you like malicious. You, you, you kind of throw your stick off like you're trying to swat a fly. You just cracked that man's teeth off. That was a. Pretty hard swat of a fly. Sorry, Tom Wilson doesn't deserve the benefit of the no, doubt. No, and he's also I, recently I, suspended I in 21, the guy. I think. I love the guy. I love yeah. him. He's one of my favorite players. I would kill for him in blue and white. Yeah. Did that on purpose. He slashed him in the mouth. He brought his stick yeah, around and hammered him in the mouth. Tried I think to, he tried to whack him. And tried to swat him, him away, and he it went miserable on him. <laughs> Just because he's out of North Toronto Arena, like... He slashed him in the mouth. It was on purpose. He looked at his head, brought his stick around, and slashed him in the mouth on purpose. It's like purpose. after you break a glass in your kitchen or something, and you're like, oh, like the second you let go of it, you're like, oh, that was bad. <laughs> and I know what I did. Like, as soon as he hit him, he's like, oh, I'm getting sped up that. Like, oh, my wife's going to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> he's like instantly knew he had messed up. All right. Um, Five games. Raise your hand if you're really surprised that Tortorella is scratching John Couturier again, because that's. I, I suggested it yesterday, did I not? I the thought women you're in? for sure someone would have gone to him and say, uh, we, we just named him captain a oh, month stop. ago. So, like, let's not really embarrass ourselves even more that we picked the wrong guy as a captain. Yeah, I got two thoughts on this. One is that it's you don't change a winning lineup, which is the dumbest policy in sports it is superstitious it's like horoscopes it's like it's either that it's superstition it won so we're gonna stick with it or it's that you don't think he's one of your best 13 guys if you think he's one of your best 13 guys or 12 guys I, put him back in I don't otherwise know it's superstition. if i don't know if there's ever been a, a team that has bought into that superstition when it comes to their captain or highest paid player on the team yeah is he not a eight million dollar player yeah until 2030 so like <laughs> oh my god <laughs> no. i don't know find me an example of that can't i can't and and a coach who won't defend the action or even discuss the action I, this to me is a guy double triple down whatever you want to call it who's just being stubborn he is picking a fight with hockey, because they... He, he remains the story, right? Well, you think he likes that? I oh, think he I loves it. I, loves it. And it's it. easy to faux defend and say, well, we won last game. We won last game. I'm going to come in with the faux defense. If you're going to scratch your captain against the Toronto Maple Leafs, and your team's going to come out there and beat them, when the, a team they hadn't beat in three years, right? Was it nine games in a row the Leafs had beat, or eight games in a row? And they beat them. They didn't, wasn't pretty for a lot of it, but they get by him and you're still in a playoff spot. It would be inconsistent to me to bring him back. Like to me, it's if the, you preach an accountability or whatever, you got what you wanted out of your you team. Did. You, you got, got the what win. You, wanted. you sent you your message. You got the response. No, I, can, can you get it 82 times? I, I don't know. I just, just I never, feel, I feel like if you were, if you put him right back in, it's even weirder to me. I don't know. I, I, I'm kind message. of confused by it. It's the same message. Either you're a better team with him or without him. They got all the licks they're, they're, in that lineup. If they believe that they've got the best chance to win tonight with him out of the lineup, 
That's a problem. Something's seriously wrong (laughs) with your team. Well, it's almost accusatory to your general manager and to the the management of uh, this guy's under contract for this long. You're almost saying, I can't even use this guy you just gave this money to. He's... I understand that this particular group did not give him the money, if I'm not mistaken. But it's just, it's really embarrassing a guy saying, I can't even use him. He's not better than this young kid. Even worse than making him a healthy scratch for the second day in a row is doubling down on his refusal to even speak about him. Do we, do you have an updated version of the media asking him about him i don't have it but it was really easy i'm not talking about sean i just did the clip just i'm not talking about sean just stick with your decision okay at the end of the day you're the coach i get that but just talk about your captain Mm -hmm. who's still a very big part of your team to just just swat him like tom wilson did gregor with the (laughs) stick (laughs) yeah is just wrong. And then the next game or down the stretch as they're in this playoff push, you want your captain to stand up in the room and direct the boys, tell everyone, here's what we got to do tonight. And everyone's going, the coach doesn't even think this guy's good enough to play. You know, like, what, what am I? Yeah, you're you're fine. It's like, I loved Andrew Ference. Remember, he was captain for Edmonton. He was the seventh D at times. It's really hard to lead from a position of, not being in the lineup. And I think Ference would say the same thing, and I'm sure Couturier would tell you the same thing. Wow. It diminishes your ability to lead. And they're like we've sat here over many years now saying that like you like torts and you like parts of him and he's Yeah, he's great entertainment value. Great entertainment value and loves pets. <laughs> loves mean, his dogs. Here, but you he, can't treat the dog's better than your players. <laughs> he, can you? He's Babcock with better PR. That's what he is. <laughs> like, treat them the same. <laughs> yeah. He seems to know. He doesn't go through guys' phones. Yeah. But he scratches, he scratches guys and, you know, like, you think back to the Roberto Luongo situation. We had Scott Hart. Oh, yeah. Where he scratched him in the, when the outdoor game. Outdoor game. He had which Luongo drove him on out the of bench. There. Drove him out of there. Uh, you think about you know yeah, him the scratch. screens on the PK. I remember that. And who is it that was going after him today? Dubinsky. Yeah, Brandon Dubinsky. What did he say? No love loss there. <laughs> I just basically. Oh, did he write you a handwritten note? Yeah, G- <laughs> Dubinsky said, "Torts, your tactics are getting old. Instead of scratching and embarrassing your captain and one of your best players, how about you try and tell him I'm giving you 20 minutes tomorrow night, no matter what, with PP and PK, and go play, play free and have fun and effing get it done." You know, that's the idea of it's like you're going to play your way through this because we trust and believe in the player you are. So TJ Brody from the Toronto Maple Leafs is not the captain. And Sheldon Keefe called his healthy scratch last night uh, a mental break. Is that that the term that he used? Mm -hmm. Yep. He seems rested though, right? A little gentler. He said mental break, but he also said he's had a tough season for us and he's trying to find it and we think he could use a little rest and that all... Checks out. That all checks out. Sheldon didn't turn around and go, I'm not talking about TJ Brody. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, it, it's not that big a deal so to discuss have to, why you scratch a guy, frankly. So does he not know like tomorrow the media is gonna come back to them to, to him and, and ask the same question? Yeah. Like eventually you gotta come up with a new answer. Yeah. He's trying to be as mean as possible to deter them from coming back. Like, he's trying to make it seem as little of a deal as it is so that they'll stop asking these questions. But it's not scratching a guy at the bottom of the line. Is he acting like a guy that was thrilled that Sean Couturier was going to be his captain? No, but he is acting like a guy who's thrilled that they won and he got to look right the other night. And boy, they shouldn't have won. No, they did not play great. Oh, all right. Sammy, what else you got for us? Uh, Blue Jackets, uh, could they attempt to trade Johnny Hockey? I <laughs> just, uh, we're now ho- doing Blue Jays talk. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah it was a good, good for us. Welcome to Blue Jays talk. We can talk uh, briefly boys, about got, the Blue Jays. Hey, I'm not, you are. I got some thoughts. Like, yeah, if you guys, guys are, <laughs> would we already do the, who's the guy's name? Is Isaiah Kiner Fali- uh, Falefa? Falefa? Yeah, Falefa, he's not yeah. great. Uh, hey, Dalton Bar Show, having a great spring. Flatty, as my. I like that Vogelbach comes up to the plate to a milkshake. And he, you know, he's a big unit out there. Yeah. I like him too. Uh, I just saw this uh, about 
uh, from the Boston Globe. Globe. Don't know how much validity to it there is, but just in alluding to the fact that could a new, you know, front office come in there and potentially want to try to trade that contract? Is that a immovable contract? I don't. I don't buy into completely unmovable contracts. No, I think there are over thirty-two teams. There's someone that's gonna say, "I'll trade you my headache for your headache," and if it happens to be different positional players, they may. Obviously, it's money in, money out. Yeah. But once you're past that, I think. I think there's opportunities to say, okay, this guy, I got to get him out of my room, or Columbus he needs tried a break. To do that, right? They tried to trade Line A for Dubois for was that headache for headache, or maybe it went the other way, whatever it was, and that didn't work. But yes, you're right. It is, it is possible. But I imagine if a new management comes in, it's tough to get elite talent to Columbus. I imagine the first thing you would do is like, let's see if a summer off and a fresh start can give this guy, you know, if we can get a 85 point Johnny Goodrow back again. Probably the best step to having success. Where your expectations are next year again. But you got to have NHL players on I your know, team. and you have to entertain, and you're asking these people yeah. for season ticket money, and they're not going to want to go there and see a slug. Yeah. <laughs> He's having a putrid season. Well, you know what? I'll, let me say, I feel like he kind of deserves one. You know, he, he chose Columbus in the most arbitrary, non-competitive matter. It was like not even close to his family, which is the original thing. It was not to a team that had a chance to contend. It was almost to just go play out his days. Anywhere like sending, but. Yeah, sending your old dog to a family farm to run around <laughs> for his final days, for an eight-year final day contract. Yeah, he is a uh, – got a lot of dash. Dash 33 last year, dash 22 this year. Uh, the other one, too, is, uh, is Liney. You just mentioned, and – of course, he's out now and won't return, but he's still got a hefty contract here, if I'm not mistaken. Two more years? I would. At eight? Got a big oh. nut. <laughs> That's a big nut. I, I was going to say I'd buy low on that guy. Yeah. But can I, you get them to retain? Yeah, well, that's what it would have to kind of take a little bit. But we'll see if the... Rick Nash, when he comes back from <laughs> just World Championship. He's got a big job to do there, Rick Nash. He's got a big one to do. That's a lot of cleaning up. Hey, uh, but, oh, go ahead. Is it Buffalo Sabres not out of it, out of it? They got the Oilers tonight. Oh, no? We're not buying that? <laughs> no. They're out of it. They're done. All right. If we're if that's where we're at about reaching, a, I think that's as far down as we'll go in the, in the Eastern Conference. But I, to me, it doesn't seem like they're still they're still in it. Does not seem viable. No, absolutely. Although Penguins could I, get hard too. I, I like that trade for Middlestat for uh, Bone. You, you liked it, yeah, yes. for them in terms of yeah. taking a step. Like they've played well the last little bit here, but no, a little too, little too late. Unfortunately, they're just playing themselves out of a good draft position. Last year, they missed playoffs by one point as well. I, I just th think they make a coaching hey, change. Have you seen the Casey Middlestat quotes about how hard Colorado practices? And how fast and how he actually sweats at morning skate. <laughs> yeah. He, this wow. guy, he, he's got two separate quotes over the last, since he's been in Colorado, that the things he's most impressed about are the pace that they play, but the pace they practice. And he goes, I was actually sweating after morning skate, which to me is like the harshest indictment of your former team. I was actually sweating. I, like yeah. I, I get sweaty putting on my shoulder pads. How I do know. you not sweat at morning skate? Well, I've, I've heard that Buffalo is a little bit easygoing. And if you miss the playoffs by a point and you got the yeah. country club when reputation. I, when I got traded to the Leafs, I flew to Dallas for my first game. Mm -hmm. And Pat Burns had the guys out there for like 40 minutes. And I'm like, <laughs> this is a game crazy. Time. Like, this is not, this is a practice. This is not a warm-up morning skate. Yeah. Like, I don't know how often... Sheldon Keefe would go out for morning skate these days, but I bet it's not often. Like, I think it's mostly the guys go on, uh, out there. The assistants have a few drills if you want to do them. And this point of the Handle year, the puck. Not, yeah. Fire a couple in. Yeah, loosen up and see how your injury, nagging injury everyone has feels. And Hey, were you, did you like morning? Like, did you I do like the skates? I like to get out there before anyone else, fresh bucket of pucks and goof around a bit. Yeah. I don't know. They, they'd never get rid of them. 
No, I, I think you would skates, have to offer them. You know, people trying new gear, and like sometimes you got to get on the ice to test your ankle or whatever it is. You got to have them. Twelve hundred points for Andre Kopitar. What a career! Twelve hundred points, Selkie trophies, Stanley Cups. Are they comfortable? Oh yeah, they're they're in. Yeah, they, they are. Come to, they're not super not comfortable. I mean, you would need Minnesota took a big loss last night, right? Like. It's L.A. It's Minnesota who could have caught L.A., and L.A. handed them a touchdown loss last night, they're unconverted. Missing, they're missing, like, $14 million on their salary cap. That stinks. It's amazing. Does it get better next year? No, no I think it's this year and next year that are the, 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 the big holes it's, off of the Parisi uh, suitor buyout. Yeah. To me, it's, you know, like, pretty remarkable that they've been this competitive for multiple seasons. It's also the sort of the the hot dog man meme that we're all looking for the guy who did this. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's literally the general manager who put himself in this situation. But the fact that they're playing fourteen million dollars that is three good players next year. They also do Kip eat a fourteen point seven wow. million yeah. dollar hit, and right. then the following year drops down to one point. They hated those guys. Well, <laughs> like, sometimes oh I think God. culturally you just have to like prune the hedges. And let some other guys rise up and take. They made control. a mistake with uh, buying out Suter. Yeah, Suter they could have hung on to. Could've hung on to. You could have fished somebody in to take them and and eat two million, three million. The fence are hard still. It's crazy they couldn't find anyone to take Suter's money, given that he went on to have four or more good seasons. Yeah, he's, at four and a half million dollars, right for Dallas. Yeah, he's still buying seventy games. They this just year's. wanted him out of the room. That badly. Yeah. And that happens, right? I think that was part of San Jose when they moved on from Thornton and Marlowe. It's not that the guys are necessarily bad guys. It's that they just need to f- a fresh start. They no, I think the they thought he was a bad guy. Suter. Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, well. I do. <laughs> okay, then. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's very possible, too. Sometimes you're like, all right, this guy's just kind of suffocating all the, what do we call it, a energy vacuum? Yes. Just, Sucking all the fun out of the he, room. That does happen. Ryan Suter is so rich. <laughs> like he signed, didn't he sign one of those crazy? He was before very mean the, to me in university. They, they so were, I don't they, like him. Uh, both they they had um, the same contracts. Did they not? And they both made one thirteen. Thirteen year, ninety eight million dollar oh, contract that he signed. Thirteen years. Not Her cousins laughs at their career earnings. And then yeah, it's true. But he signed another one right after that with the Stars, right? Where he got a lot of money too. Years Plus, he gets the buyout money on top of it. Like, that's a, I, I think I've told you guys this story before, but it was I was at Islanders training camp and I played golf with Bill Guerin after the round. We're sitting around. Mm. He's telling me my daughter's in horseback riding. My son's in you know elite hockey. He's got four kids or and all these things. I was like, that's got to be expensive. He's like, well, not to be a dick, but I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about at the time he was getting paid by three teams. He was getting paid by St. Louis, San Jose. He was on the Islanders. Like from bios, you're just collecting checks from every direction. This bio thing's not so bad if you can get another deal. Wow. What a great answer. I know. <laughs> you know like, we all aspire to be able to answer that. Yeah. Question. Like, you know, sorry, man, but like, here's, here's reality yeah, for me. It's not happened today or by, tomorrow for us. By the way, Ryan Suter, $111 million made in his not career. Not bad. Man. Not bad. Yep, pretty good. All right. Tampa Bay at San Jose. Is that a cookie night for Kucherov? And- oh, yeah. Absolutely. Point. And uh, Tampa can catch Toronto. It is not done. Quickly, before we go, I'm heading out to Guelph right after the show to watch my beloved Own Sound Attack go for their 30th victory, which would be their 13th straight year having that. Only the London Knights in the history of the CHL have done that. Hey, heading out to Guelph to see them do it tonight. My favorite go attack, OHL go, team. baby. And all of that has nothing to do with you. What do you mean? Oh, he's like an honorary guy. Oh, buddy, I I adore this team. I, I love them. I always will. Season ticket holder so, so for you've cheered years. them on to this. Oh, yes. I've been okay. there for 13 That's of fair. the seasons. That's fair. Yeah. I'm an honorary coach. Our thanks to Craig Simpson for joining us at the top of the hour. And who did we have in the first hour? Uh, Craig, Simmer. Craig, we had Craig Simpson. We had Dan Murphy in the second Oh, hour. Dan Murphy. Yeah. 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 Right. Lost my train of thought. Very unprofessional of me. <laughs> Enjoy your night, everybody. We're back tomorrow on Off the Rails Friday with Doug McClain.